first saw Tycho in San Francisco at the Cherry Blossom Festival Parade. And I just remember this flatbed truck with people on top of it playing Tycho, and it was so dynamic, and women were really powerful and active and energetic. And um, so that was the image I always had in my mind. The very first time I saw Tycho was at Bumbershoot in Seattle. Um, and I saw Kenny Endo play with a um, jazz musician, and they were doing some really crazy experimental work, and it was really interesting and, and cool, um, and uh, a glimpse into um, some of the influences that I would later have. I had no idea that that would be the case, but that we would la later have um, from Kenny, who was such an important part of our experience at Portland Tycho. I first saw Tycho when I was um, in Seattle, when I was probably about 12 or so, and I'd never seen it before. I saw these people up on the stage moving around, these Asian Americans being very loud and energetic and, and um, joyous, and I was just captivated by it um, and knew at that moment that it was something that I had to be a part of. It was actually Eugene Tycho that I saw and I knew somebody that was playing, one of the, the founding members of Eugene Tycho. And, um, and she's somebody that I know that when you meet her, you wouldn't necessarily assume that she would be this super loud powerhouse in, in any way. And there was something that when I got to see her on the stage and playing Tycho, that she was able to step into something of who she was in this whole different way. And I remember crying when I watched. Like, you know, we found that with lots of people, but, but particularly for um, women and Asian women that we performed in front of and, um, and then had a chance to, you know, give, give them a chance to play and stuff. You could just see there's something about the combination of the power of the, of the art form and, um, and the contradiction that it is to what the oppression has really told us about who we can and can't be, that um, it just, it really moved me and definitely inspired me to want to want some of that. Portland, um, being a, a, a one of the, uh, the major city in Oregon, was unique in that we did not have a Taiko group. And so there were, so when a uh, Buddhist temple had their Obon festival, they had to bring a group from Seattle uh, or other groups who would have a, uh, uh, some kind of reception and they wanted Taiko as an entertainment or background or whatever. They would have Eugene Taiko come. And there was always a comment uh, buzzing around, why doesn't Portland have a Taiko group too. It would be so fun to have our own Taiko group. I was helping to organize Kudabu, which was the summer program for the Japanese uh, immersion program at Richmond School. We wanted to find a way to continue the kids' uh, learning of Japanese during the summer, but in a totally non-academic setting, something that had to do with playing playing in Japanese, learning completely different things, interacting in an informal way with Japanese counselors and teachers. So we put Kurabu together, and uh, through Shisao's contact with Russell and Jeannie, we brought Russell and Jeannie up to do taiko workshops at Kurabu. There is just a lot of community organizing and talk about educating the public about uh, camp and the whole camp experience and uh, pilgrimages were had been going on for some time then and Taiko was always a part of that. It's really always been a part of the Japanese American experience of, you know, expression. Because I was a community organizer, I knew some people that wanted to start a Taiko group and we had some contacts outside of that in, in Mount Shasta. So when Russell and Jeannie came to do Taika with the kids, we had them do an adult workshop with those of us who were interested. The very first time I actually hit the Taika was 
few years before Portland Tycho started, and that workshop happened in um, Epworth Church. There were maybe a dozen to 15 people. Um, it was really a scary experience for me, very intimidating. <laughs> um, they came back again the next year, did another workshop, did a performance. And so we were, and they had then all along had sent us um, a few pages, like mimeograph pages or photocopied pages of how to build a drum. So it was about between 1990 and 1994, there were uh, half a dozen or so of us sort of talking about how do we get ourselves organized and how do we get Tycho, but we could not figure out how to translate written document into an actual drum building activity. Fortunately for us, uh, I think that second year, Anne and Zach moved to Portland. Voila, up on I-5 from south came Anne and Zach from California. We had been involved with uh, Stanford Tyco in California and it was time to graduate and move on. We actually stayed a little bit later and continued to play on with the group. And then it became clear there was time to start adulting. And <laughs> we decided- um, A long that, process. Yeah, it took a little <laughs> while. Uh, to move to uh, Portland, it was a place that we'd heard a lot about. Zach had some relatives there. We came and visited. Um, and there was kind of a crystallizing moment, actually, when we went and visited the plaza, um, the Japanese American Historical Plaza, and saw the stones there and sort of connected to some of the histories there. They arrived right about the time that Russell and Jeannie were doing their final performance with the kids. And Zach came and visited, saw that, and then continued to meet with our little community group and they and Zach had the full experience of having built Stanford Tyco. There was energy in Portland already around Tyco, and so we were we were coming. We were, we were at the right place at the right time because we had some experience, you know, not a lot, but some experience of how to build drums and and had you know had learned some pieces, um, and so we could we could get started. So we had something to play. And I don't think there was any, you know, official membership. Uh, process. They just wanted, you know, uh, bodies with um, arms and legs. <laughs> but we were involved from the very beginning of making the drums, you know, starting with the with the sticks on the floor, the hands on the floor, <laughs> and then making dowels, cheap dowels. We can get cheap, cheap dowels, you know, we can cut them and we can sand them and that's what we did. And um, then brought in phone books and then, you know, brought in tires and covered the tires up and we'd load the tires in and out and set up the chairs. Because we had to do everything, everybody participated in the process. How often the rehearsal should be, who's going to run the rehearsals, when we would have the rehearsals, where we would have a rehearsal. So I had my own dance studio with mirrors and uh, and it allowed us to then have some practices there, you know, and gather at the um, Buckman Dance Studio. I don't know who was the principal at the time, but it's like, sure, you know, yeah, you can use the studio. <laughs> or maybe I didn't even ask. I don't really know. I don't remember, but it would be like me not to even ask. There were folks, especially the Nisei, who embraced the beginnings of the group. George Azumano, just one of the most, you know, revered leaders in the community, told us that he'd always wanted to see a taiko group in Portland. So he was an early financial supporter, uh, came to performances. John Murakami was an incredibly important uh, person for the group. Uh, he helped us build our drums. So it! He went to the Japanese Ancestral Society and asked them for money to buy us a saw. We, we weren't even thinking about it, but he, he just, oh, this is what you need. And then he would invited us to his home to work in his workshop and help figure out 
all the ways that we were going to use a router and all the refinements of how we were going to build these drums. It was very empowering to learn how to use these tools that make loud noises and create a lot of sawdust and, and be able to see the product at the end. Yoji Matsushima of the Onsen Corporation knew that there was a drum that they'd been storing for decades in his company warehouse. It had been given by a Japanese trade association to the Japanese Ancestral Society in Portland. But no, you know, I think it had been used for Obon and various community celebrations, but it, you know, it's worn out. I think maybe the head needed to be repaired and it was just sitting in the warehouse and Yoji offered it to us and June Schumann spearheaded repairing uh, and refinishing the drum uh, that we still, we call, that we still play with, this, that we call the onsen, that is a traditional Japanese drum made from the whole trunk of a tree, unlike our barrel stave type drums, American style drums. I think within the first year, we had the first gig at an elementary school, and our first very uniform was a white t-shirt. No, no graphics, no color, just white t-shirt, and we had uh, strips of white sheet as our hachimaki. They were doing amazing things with just, you know, setting up their organization and their staff and their schedule and their repertoire. And those are all things that we are still benefiting from today. And I think we're really, really lucky that um, they set such a strong foundation very early on. Taiko was definitely a place um, that answered a lot for me in regards to my own identity. Um, as a Japanese American fourth generation, there was a place in which um, I hadn't had any sort of artistic expression that, that really recognized um, sort of my full story. And San Jose Taiko, especially with their Asian American roots and activism, um, really answered a lot of those questions for me to become curious and to start investigating my own family history. And the other part about Taiko as an art form that was immediately um, so riveting for, for myself personally was that um, combination of sound and form with the body. Um, it was empowering in so many different ways. Um, and I really, really wanted to explore that. It got me really excited and my full physic, the whole physicality of it was um, really what drew me to the art form. For the first RTG, every group got to perform. Um, just like a couple pieces because it was our first time like meeting each other and um, And I remember Portland Tycho performing. I remember it very vividly. I Knew right away that I wanted to play with them someday and um, Idolized Anne of course I got to take a workshop with her at RTG or conference or something and I was so like Like awestruck being able to play with her. So that was pretty cool. The 2018 Eclipse performance that we did, uh, there was an OMSI event down in Salem and they invited us to play. And that, that was just, that was a real highlight. We played at sunrise, we played as the Eclipse began, um, we were silent during the totality and then we played out of the Eclipse. And I was playing, I think we played Ha into the totality and I was playing the big, the big Odaiko. I was facing the big Odaiko, of course, to play it, and the, the sun was behind me. And so as, as the eclipse was, it was sort, this was sort of near the end of the eclipse, as, as it was, the sun was being completely covered, I was playing the drum and I could see it on the face of the drum as if the drum was the sun. A very cool way to experience the eclipse. And then during the total, totality, we stopped playing and were able to watch. I think if I had to choose one today, it would probably be when we took the, um, the pilgrimage to Minidoka and got to perform there. And for me, it was extremely personal because 
Um, that's where my family was interned. And I also know that I probably would never take it upon myself to just go by myself on this kind of trip. And so to go with Portland Tycho was a really special experience. I think I had only been with Portland Tycho for, um, it was still pretty early. And it, I felt like it totally just secured and um, like really confirmed why I chose Portland Tycho as my Tycho home. Yeah, the memorable performance for me, um, the performance called the people with the drum. Mm. Yeah, I mean, concept is awesome and the people are awesome. But one thing I strongly remember, that was the last performance that Obo could do. Um, yeah. And then mm -hmm. after that, yeah, he passed away. That, that was definitely a um, like, memorable performance. The how especially Obo performed that stage was so powerful. One was actually in response uh, to the 311 tsunami at Portland State University. Um, and that was a pretty tremendous uh, one where the community came together and mm. we put that concert together in like less than two days. Um, additionally, there was 10 Tiny Taiko Dances, um, which was to work on a 4 by 4 stage in collaboration with Mike Barber. That was um, 10 curated original experiences that was just really fun to work with, that limitation of space. And the last one that comes to my mind is in the footsteps of our ancestors, when I was able to bring my teacher Shohei Kikuchi from Wadabiza and um, make and design a whole show that really celebrated that uh, fusion and lineage of folk dance and taiko. For me, the most memorable performance was performing for the Asian Club at Oregon State Prison. Of course, just going in the prison itself is a, a wild experience. All the no metal, no shirts with logos, no denim, x-rays or the drums to make sure we weren't bringing any contraband inside or taking anybody out when we left. The actual uh, event with the prisoners was just so memorable to sit and chat with, with them and their families. The meal itself for them was very special. I mean, they'd had to save a lot of their earnings to be able to have a special meal for their families. And when we played, I just felt just this amazing sense of how, what a privilege it was to be there, but also that we were expressing um, freedom and um, how you can really express feelings, strong feelings in a positive way, you know, through that, the passion, the power of hitting the drums, and um, that that wasn't a freedom that they had. Sometimes you'd be in these uh, very small rural communities and we'd roll into town this predominantly Asian American group and it, we would, it would be like this um, major event. <laughs> We, even just going to a restaurant to get pizza or something, <laughs> let alone the performance itself. And so it was, it was um, eye-opening, I think, both for them and for us uh, to experience those communities. Um, and I also learned that no matter how small the community is, there's, there's always a family or two of Asian Americans who are hungry um, f to sort of connect um, and to kind of broaden the purview of those communities. Um, and so that was really gratifying, exciting to see people be able to really connect with an art form that um, they had never experienced before and maybe a cultural experience that might have seemed very foreign to them prior, um, but that they had a, a, a real connection to. You know, we did uh, a version of Amaterasu, the story, only we had a couple different versions. <laughs> <laughs> we are the <laughs> 
so there was the school show version and then there was the concert version which was a longer you know with with usually I think with Anne sort of telling the story and then us acting it out but in the school show version we each have our own little parts to it so we would both say them and act them out and there was at least one performance where the two got meshed together and you know and in the middle of the performance of the story we had to you know you're adjusting to people around you and stuff anyway it all worked out just fine and everybody loved it but we laughed so hard afterwards it was just like it was a miracle that somehow we didn't run into each other or do something because probably we were laughing so hard I don't know how this happened but we were this was um, I don't know if we went to dim sum or something we were late or what happened but we were, you were probably trying to get some food. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and this is like my, my part of my role on, on tour for some uh, really self-destructive reason was to be the person who worried about whether we were going to get, whether the drums were going to arrive or where, whether we were going to get there on time. And um, we were late for the Kennedy Center performance. Um, and Rachel Ibora and I were in the car. I think that Rachel was driving. I'm pretty sure she was driving and I was navigating because it was definitely my fault. So we're dr trying to drive around Washington D.C. and anybody who's you know, D.C. is like so confusing. Like I don't know who, who what the it was a anyway the, the none the of us had ever driven right. around Washington right, right. D.C. Right, right, and it's like in it's, a huge it has, truck. You know, some French guy laid it out, and it's totally confusing. Um, and and we're late, and lo and behold, like I'm looking at, and this is like pre iPhone. We don't, you know, I'm we're using this Garmin thing, and 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 I totally misread the directions, and and. We, you know, we missed the turn, and it was going to take a. It took us so so long, and so I was, I think, literally in the fetal position in the in the, in the car, just <laughs> sort of moaning and groaning over there as Rachel was just like, "Shut up, Zach. We need just. Where do I go now?" So somehow we got there like with minutes to spare. Wait, hold and on, we, hold on. You didn't talk about the part. We took a detour. We went on one of those roads that you're not supposed to take a truck on, and there was a minimum height. Oh, thing and I was sure we were going to shear off the top of the rental truck. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we, we, it was it was completely so horrifying and terrifying and felt like so high profile. Like this is the Kennedy Center. How could we be late for the Kennedy so, Center? So yeah, so we we you know we were trying to call ahead. We did have our little flip phones. We we're trying to call ahead to get to get help. And so we got there and literally we're running through the Kennedy Center, rolling these cases to to get to get ready for. They had a special stage. Uh, I can't. Remember. I think it was another millennial millennium thing. Anyway, we, we, we got there just on time, or just just in, barely in the nick of time for the performance, and it, it went great. It was actually a really amazing experience, but completely terrifying, and I'm sure I'm going, it took a year or two off my life. We used to spend a great deal of time talking about how the mission statement uh, connects with us individually as performers. I, I think school programs are great examples of how Taiko performance can be used as a teaching tool. The Japanese Americans who started to play Taiko did it as a way to show their pride in who they were as Asian Americans. So they added some of the music that they grew up with as Americans. Music like jazz and soul and funk. I think one of the hallmarks of Portland Taiko has been um, using, doing original compositions, oftentimes around topics that are closely related to Japanese American history, or in some cases we've collaborated with other communities to try and pull out issues, common common interests that that we want to try and express through uh, through Taiko. It is the driving principle of the organization. So decisions that you question, decisions that you have to come with as an organization or as an individual, that's something that you can rely on to help you make your decision. Does it fall within the parameters of inspiring audiences? Does it build community? Does it, does it, will it add something? Will it enrich someone's life? It's an active and relevant um, mission statement that was created a while ago, but it's still very much 
applicable today. I think Portland Tycho's approach to performance is important in that it's always about inspiring audiences, whether that means pushing the boundaries of Tycho. So, uh, for example, in 2018, we commissioned composer Kenji Bunch to write a piece for Tycho, flute, violin, and cello. <laughs> And so in this way, it's inspiring our audiences and also pushing ourselves to uh, create new Taiko works with different combinations of sounds uh, and things that we hadn't considered before. Sometimes inspiring audiences meaning, means just reaching back to the core repertoire, so playing Taiko that just moves the body uh, and moves the soul in that way. But Portland Taiko also takes to heart its mission of educating about its heritage and culture. So for most performances, we're also talking about the development of taiko as an art form, its roots in Japanese culture, and what changes happened uh, once Japanese Americans started to perform taiko. So at any given performance, we're not only performing, but we're talking about Japanese taiko, about Japanese American and Asian American creativity, and that how that fits in just to the overall American landscape. In 2016, I started talking with our artistic staff about bringing all of the Portland-based taiko groups together on stage. So the groups have met at Mochitsuki and other community events and have shared the stage before, but never all four of us together. So we planned a concert called Taiko Together in which all of the groups would perform individual sets, but we would also have new collaborations between the groups. The concert was an enormous success. We sold out to PCC Sylvania's Performing Arts Center. And I think this kind of cooperation paved the way uh, for projects uh, that are coming to fruition now. All of the four Portland-based Taiko groups, as well as PSU and Catlin Gable's Taiko groups, are working together to host the North American Taiko Conference, which will be coming to the PSU campus in August 2019. As time has gone, gone on, I think people are more and more separate, um, feel separate, feel separated. And so a group like Portland Taiko is really important because it not only maintains a connection to the history of Japanese American activism uh, in America, but also um, teaches that, but brings people together to experience that. There was a time early on when we started to wonder, like, should we, this, is that kind of presumptuous on the one hand to call this Portland Taiko? And on the other hand, should we have some other name that won't necessarily root the group to this particular place geographically? And we had those kind of conversations and eventually landed on like, no, this, this is Portland Taiko. It is about this particular place, this particular community. And I think that the ways that it's evolved actually are very reflective of Portland as a, as a broader community in terms of um, a set of um, commitments um, that are sort of at the foundation of it. Also, the sort of diverse collaborations that we've engaged in over the years and a kind of scrappiness especially in the beginning about um, you know, starting something new, trying something different. Um, so we're building on the foundation that so many other Taiko groups had already uh, established and we're trying new things, we're innovating and um, exploring other possibilities. And um, I think that's a, that's a very Portland kind of attitude. I think we've witnessed firsthand a lot of the, um, the power that Taiko can have in the community. And I first heard about that power through Anne when she was taking this course at Stanford about the connection of Tycho and the redress movement of the incarceration and how Tycho was this really you know, important kind of symbol of political voice and, and shatterer of stereotypes and just, you know, it had this, it had this power. 
um, that the redress movement harnessed um, to make a change. Community um, feeds back and nurtures Tycho. Um, and that I think that's part of what uh, we experienced with those early days in the Japanese American community, you know, just that um, that's why we were able to be so um, successful as an organization because we had that kind of support in so many different ways. When there's a kind of a cultivation of that relationship between the drum and the community or and celebration of it and kind of service to it, um, the sky is the limit. And I, that's what's really exciting to me about what's happening right now with Portland Tycho. Fun. Strength. Right now it would be exuberance. Power. Powerful. Energetic. Connection. Community. 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 Through innovation and excellence in Tycho, Portland Tycho affirms Asian American pride, inspires audiences, builds community, and educates about its heritage and culture. Since 1994, Portland Taiko has practiced the art of Japanese Taiko drumming with a sense of Asian American identity, creativity, and empowerment. The group has headlined at arts festivals and concert halls from Washington, D.C. to Hawaii, and has performed at community events and schools across the Pacific Northwest, reaching over one million audience members. Throughout its history, Portland Taiko has collaborated with Taiko artists and ensembles, musicians, composers, storytellers, poets, and dancers. To view our performance schedule, book a performance, or learn about classes and workshops, please visit our website at www.portlandtaiko.org.